they always want to condemn the things that don't cost them. Exactly. Hey everybody, welcome to Comfort Talk. My name is Richard and I've got a special guest today, John Harris. Uh, he is in residency. He had a, We uh, had him preach today. It was a wonderful time and did a, a presentation here at the church I pastor in Kentucky and uh, talked about social justice. You preached from Romans 16 before that. It was a great time. Really yeah, good thank barbecue. you for having me. Yeah, thanks had for a, coming had a wonderful out. time, yeah. Yeah, you were in Shelbyville yesterday, so that was good. I went to the that's right. Men's conference there for uh, Reformation Church there in Shelbyville. Good networking, good food. Yeah. Can't yeah. beat it. It was good. Lots and lots of barbecue here in Kentucky. So, um, well, I appreciate you taking some time. Yeah. Um, and I've I've paid attention to the podcast. And of course, you're not just some raving lunatic like some people want to make you out to be. Especially now, getting <laughs> to know you a little bit more. Um, and you've also written on this. You also have, you know, not only an MDiv but an MA and church history or uh just history, just, just history in general, general history, right? that's right yeah. and so you're not again you're not just screaming about critical theory or you know about these or that just random twitter feats you know you're you're calculated and seeing this is a threat and these things are a problem and you're using a lot of scripture which is what i appreciate that's what i try and do uh, on my channel as well and try and help the audience let's go back to the scripture what does the text say and how do we deal with it Right. Um, so again, I'm, I'm very thankful for that and just the different stuff that you do. Um, that being said, I know we could talk about a lot of different things, but I've got a number of friends and colleagues, coworkers, former coworkers who are sympathetic. You know, they still see, you know, they might read a gospel coalition article or T4G and think, ah, Platt, really? Ah, you butchered that. Or that's just a weird, you know, and they're kind of head scratching. Um, but they're still going to, have a piece in their heart that it's really like, yeah, but there's a lot of injustices. And I think we could use these as tools. We could be more sensitive. Why don't you just kind of give your appeal to to those mm. that crowd, you know, guys in their 20s and 30s, in, in their, their 40s, that maybe pastors, maybe they're just churchmen, been to the seminaries. I'm a graduate of Southern Seminary. You went to Southeastern. Right? That's right. We we appreciate it, but it's there's there's this infection that's coming in, and it has been there, and it's like ugh, you can't ignore the infection. Like, what are we doing here? So appeal to them. Just well, just... I, I used to be you. I mean, that's <laughs> kind of the thing I could say first. Like, I I was there in some ways at one point. Probably I I was in that position at one time, maybe five years ago or so, where I had joined the Southern Baptist Convention because I appreciated Al Mohler. I visited Southeastern. I really appreciated uh, Danny Aiken and my whole experience there mm. and the emphasis on missions. Uh, that was in 2014, I believe, when I visited. I, I, I just, I was all about it. And uh, my dad had left the Southern Baptist Convention. Before that, our family had been Southern Baptist. And he did it over higher criticism and evolution back in the 80s. And I wanted to bring the family back. I felt like mm. that was... Uh, a denomination going in the right direction. And I was appreciative, uh, partially because of a lot of the books that I would read. I would, I would listen mm. to also podcasts. I would I listen to the briefing every day. And, and this was, <laughs> yeah, this was who I was, you know, 10 years ago. And, uh, you couldn't have told me, I mean, if you came to me and just said, Hey, you know, Danny Aiken's compromised, Southeastern is going to go in this woke direction. Mulder's going to be really wishy-washy and contradict himself on a bunch of these things. I would have laughed to your face. I would have mm. said, there's absolutely no way that can be because these guys are solid men of God doing uh, very Christian things and they, they wouldn't fall for something like that. Mm. But the fact is they did uh, in some, to varying degrees. Uh, and, um, it's been that realization, and it's been it's taken me a while to. Uh, I mean, I was I was at the factory where the sausage was being made, so I didn't have I had an advantage that some don't have in that I saw before this made its way completely to pulpits. I saw where it was being propagated, and this movement really did start in the seminaries. Mm. It came in through academia. It's not like a revival that starts in churches. It started in the seminaries and then went to the churches and. Uh, and so I, by 2018, I think, I mean, 2016, I really started 
seeing something is seriously wrong. By 2018, though, I was just convinced there is mass compromise going on. Mm. Um, I think maybe it was by 2019 that I really thought, okay, I don't know if, what side – Mueller seems to be on the wrong side of this. And it was just like all these assumptions I had were kind of coming down. And so I don't expect someone necessarily – uh, to come to that conclusion right away if they're not aware of everything that's taken place. At the same time, at this point, it's hard to not be, after 2020 especially, I mean, how can you not be aware mm -hmm. of some of these things? I mean, there's all these, Seriously. the montages are out there from all these woke teachers. I mean, go follow woke preacher clips. Just <laughs> see what they're posting. Like, yeah. it, it's, uh, these are, some of them are professors at Southern Baptist institutions. Uh, I've written out two books on the topic, very mm -hmm. careful. I was trained as a historian, so I, I, I want to understand something thoroughly before I critique it. And, and so that, those, those are attempts in really understanding as much as I can the whole movement. And what I would say to someone on the fence is that uh, look past the intentions of people, mm -hmm. right? Whether or not their motives are good, sometimes people can have good motives and support really bad things, including lies. Look past the intentions. Look past... Uh, the, the optics and the fashion and the image that pastors might be trying to project mm. and, and try to look to the substance, try to look to the theology, look towards, uh, okay, let's get past um, all of those superficial things and get right down to brass tacks. What are they saying? And is it true? What are the fundamental assumptions that you would have to believe in order to make the um, ethical determinations and conclusions that they reach. And I think once you ask those deeper questions, you, so, you start finding out, wait a minute, they're importing some of, some of these false teachers, and we can get into names if you want, but some of these false teachers that may have done some very nice things years ago, they're importing a false religion into Christianity mm -hmm. and assumptions from a false religion that aren't, they're not Christian assumptions mm -hmm. about justice about truth, um, about metaphysics, the way the world is, and, and, and the most important one about the gospel itself. And, and so when I look at a guy like uh, David Platt, I think you may have mentioned, I don't know if that was before we were rolling or not, but, yeah. or J.D. Greer, um, or Matt Chandler, or you know, any, a lot of these young Calvinist uh, type guys who are uh, the, supposed to be the face of the new evangelical movement in the United States. And I look at the words that they've used and the things that they've said about this topic of social justice, I, I, I get scared. I have to say, uh, I look at some of it and it's, it's false teaching mm -hmm. and I can definitely give specifics. I talk about this in some of my books and it's not like it's been uncorrected false teaching. There have been people in these churches that have tried to confront it. It's been years of repeating the same false teachings. Yeah. And so we have to warn people about that. We don't really have an option. We were told, it shouldn't surprise us in the New Testament, we're told people will come in, it'll be subversive, they'll, the Suda Delphos and Galatians, they're false brothers, um, and th th there's a deception uh, that takes place. And if you're focused on their winsomeness or their personality, I mean, it, Paul says in Romans 16, they'll have... They'll have cunning words. They'll they'll they know what to say. Mm -hmm. So you got to get your eye off that and onto what Paul says is the substance. What do they teach? Is it theology that's contrary to the teaching that Paul left us? And if so, then uh, you know what the conclusion is. You know this person's not uh, not someone teaching the truth. They're a false teacher. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, I think the one thing that gets a lot of people is we like to look back and, you know, look at Lenin or Stalin or Hitler or somebody like that and think, well, I would have stood up. I would have said, right. Nazis are wrong. You're a Nazi and that's wrong to murder Jewish people. You know, like things like that. And it's like, I, I think it's Jordan Peterson. And I know he's, he's warming on a lot of people lately. Um, but I think he said, you would have been a Nazi in that situation. If you're not standing against XYZ problem of the day, you would have been whatever... The thing you think you were against, you wouldn't have been against. You would have been totally locked up with everybody else. You would have been a Nazi. You would have been a communist. You would have been whatever. Um, and, you know, obviously that's hyperbolic in one sense. But if you're not standing and saying, okay, we've had 50 years of Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade and we saw this at the convention in Nashville. We were there. First convention, Seth was there too. And, um, and there was this like, well, yeah, but... And you're like, abortions murder. Like, I'm sorry, wait, what, why, why are we voting? How did, what just happened? And it's like, we need to nuance this resolution. We need to yeah. change this. And it's like, 
and I, it, it, I don't know if it's Tom Askell's brother, but it's, he's, there's another Askell. It was Bill Askell. Bill yeah, Askell, yeah, yeah, out of, okay, Oklahoma, I think. I believe so, like yeah. Nebraska, something like that. And he's like, I mean, how is this not like slavery? All y'all clowns would have been all pro-slavery 200 years ago. You just would have been. And abolition, that's what happened. We had to have a civil war for it. England, you know, figured out without a war. How is abolition of abortion not the only option for the Christian? I just, you know, I don't get it. I mean, millions of babies yeah. dead now. Like, it's just, and so the same thing with this social justice is people are like, well, yeah, but it, this, and they always think they're the conservative. They always think there's people to the left of them that are worse, you know, and there's everybody, everybody can say there's somebody left and right of everybody because we're all on a spectrum. Yeah. Um, you know, the most conservative, the most liberal, but that's, that's the thing that bugs me with colleagues, with coworkers. I used to sell phones and, you know, I have one guy, he was, his professor who was kind of leading him was Jarvis Williams. And the guy was Hispanic from Texas. His dad is a, was a doctor. His mom, I think a doctor. I'm like, this guy has zero oppression. You have way more privilege than I do, but he's Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And he gobbled, and a great guy, nice guy, very charismatic, fun, you know, joking around type of guy. I, I, I don't, I don't doubt that he loves the Lord, but like that, you just have this hook, and you're just, you're just getting yanked around, and you think it's good, yeah. and you're like, brother, like, how are you missing that? So that's sure. that's that's the thing that always just struggled, uh, kind of struck me, uh, mm -hmm. is people just getting hooked. So you're saying just. Look at the substance. Don't look at the charismaticness. Don't well, look at the teacher or the nuance. It's also hard at the SBC uh, convention because the you know, how often did you hear JD Greer say the world is watching? <laughs> there's these. There's this pressure. <laughs> Seriously, it's not. Yes, the, the God's uh, watching too. By the way, but, you know. yeah. The emphasis was never about what does God want us to do. What is the truth? Mm -hmm. uh, if it's hard, if the world doesn't like it, you know, it doesn't really matter. What does God say? The emphasis was all on that the world is watching and there's these pressures that we must somehow acquiesce to or navigate in order to be a public witness. Mm. And as soon as you're uh, making that calculation, you're no longer a public witness, right? right? So you, cause you're not, what are you witnessing to? I mean, they're, they're offended by the gospel itself, our core teaching. So if, if you, you know, cave on these three issues, then maybe we can give them the gospel. No, you can't. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to listen to you just because you agree with them on some political move. And, and for the left, especially, I mean, you know, th these halfway measures aren't enough for them ever. Mm -mm. You know, they're, no, they're, they're going to come satisfy. after you. Yeah, they don't, won't satisfy them. So it, it, the whole thing is an exercise in futility. It's the goal is, is wrong. It's the orientation, the way the motivation is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, we're looking at this whole thing as if it's a political game on the surface and, uh, something as fundamental as abortion, whether or not we should murder babies or not is not, a surface level discussion. That's a fundamental discussion. And I think the bill you're, or the, uh, what do they call them? Resolution, resolution you were talking yeah. about was about abolishing human abortion that we should be, that we should work to abolish right. it and no other means is acceptable. And then you had people standing up younger than us. I'm, you know, I'm representative from Mississippi, blah, blah, yeah. blah, church, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, and there's the passion from them. And it's like, but do you not understand be like people are killing babies? Like, <laughs> like we're not saying these resolutions or these laws that abortion past 12 weeks or 16 weeks are bad necessarily, but we're saying now we need to focus strictly on this. I mean, that's, I've grown in this than probably the last two years. Uh, Cause thinking, well, you know, I would never do it, but you know, can you really make it illegal? Blah, blah, blah. And just having this weird kind of squishy middle of the road. And it's like, we're talking about murdering babies here. How ba it's like the transgender stuff. Yeah. How basic can you be like, you're a dude and you think you're a woman. Well, feelings don't make up truth. Right. So let's get you some help. Well, and I think it's fair for you to bring up uh, an analogy like slavery just because that's something that they're, even at the, that convention, because I watched it, there were still, they were introduced, certain people were introducing resolutions still to try to condemn slavery, which to me, I'm like, what? Yeah. Where, I mean, I understand there is slavery going on in the world, but it's not, certainly not an acceptable practice, at least the Chattel, Chattel slavery that they're yeah. trying to uh, virtue signal against. That's been, that, that was gone so long ago in this country, and yet a present evil that is so, let's just be honest, it's on a biblical standard, far worse than slavery ever was. We are literally murdering millions of people. You want to compare the numbers. Now, I mean, I saw a pie chart the other day. I don't know what all the numbers are uh, off the top of my head, but had every war that the United States has ever fought. Mm. 
and it was a sliver compared to the number of abortions. And it, it, there's no <laughs> there's no comparison with any of the other evils we've done uh, as as a society. I mean, this this has been allowed, and it, it's got to stop. And anything um, it, to, to to look at the same group of people trying to virtue signal against slavery, trying to virtue signal against racism, systemic mm-hmm. racism, trying to identify all these problems, but they're unwilling to, they're fighting against a motion uh, to outlaw human abortion is weird to me. Yeah, like, me I, too. That's exactly, it's like... It's, wait, you, you're saying you're about justice. You're saying you're about the oppressed. Like we have literally, this is the most oppressed uh group that we can think of being yeah. oppressed currently and you're not willing to take a hard stand on this that's weird yeah and that to me that just shows the emperor has no clothes like you that's not what you're about yeah you're about trying to get in the good graces of the culture or the world i should say in the world right now is all about blm and all about lgbt and all about feminism and me too and 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 so that those are the things you're going to try to sort of it's not like they're fully adopting every all of those positions. You know what I mean? But yeah. what they're doing is they're trying to be a belligerent with them. Mm. They're being an ally. They're trying to move the needle with them as much as they possibly can within the constraints of their denomination or evangelicalism. And, and you know, we're going to go with you as far as we can. We know you're going to go farther, but we'll go with you as far as we can and help you. And it's, this, these are the same people that are, they're going to cancel Christianity next. That's, yeah. that's their whole goal. That's their right. modus operandi. And so um, it's a, I think what it is, is, you know, you look at Nazi Germany and this whole idea, I think it was Niemöller who said, you know, first they came for, and then there's like this long list. Oh, right? yeah. You know, they, they, and I didn't say anything. And I didn't I, say yeah. Anything. And then, and then they came for me and there was no one left. To, so they came for the gypsies, they came for the Jews, uh, they came for, you know, the, I don't remember all the groups in that particular quote, yeah, but I know the phrase, yeah. But that's, that's the dynamic that's going on now. It's a staying mechanism. It's, it's a, a, uh, uh we're trying to outlast, you know, the, and you can't outlast this. This mm-hmm. is a secular religion that's going to cancel everything that does not completely march in lockstep with it. So you might get yourself five years, you might get yourself 10, I don't know. But you're never going to fully satisfy them, and they will come knocking at your door. Mm-hmm. You know, and and what just hypothetically, let's say this summer is the George Floyd moment, but it's not BLM. Let's say it's LGBTQ or transgender or something like that, and it's it's the you know they have on film some transgender person being persecuted or you know allegedly whatever, uh, and that becomes the rallying cry. And let's say the I mean we could see this happening, right? This yeah. isn't outside yeah. of the realm of possibility. The streets. Are ablaze and uh, what what do you do at that point? You know what is the, you you went with them on the BLM stuff, you went with them on the COVID stuff, you went with them on the Me Too stuff, and now you're being asked to compromise gender and mm-hmm. creative norms in such a fundamental way. Uh, if you, I mean, there's no way you can try to massage that without complete compromise. Mm-hmm. And I think we've set up a whole mechanism now for that's exactly what will happen. There will be some kind of a compromise to try to say well. We got to, you know, they have a point and we shouldn't be even thinking that way. We shouldn't be wondering like, well, is there like maybe a little kernel of truth to this horrible pagan religion? No, yeah. like the better question to ask is, okay, what, let's start off with what does the Bible say about this? Use that as the standard and then ask, does this comport to the standard? Yeah. Does, can it reconcile with what we believe? And if not, the answer is throw it away. Mm-hmm. So um, I, th- for me, this took... Uh, to, to identify specific leaders who are compromised. I mean, that took some time. It, it took some tears. I'm not going to lie. It, it it was difficult to think that people I had respected and followed were subject to these pressures when I thought they were so solid. But um, I'll tell you what, what I've seen, and this is the encouraging part, is God always has his people who won't bend the knee. There's 7,000 who have not bowed the knee. Mm-hmm. And there are people like you. There are people uh, like we we met yesterday at the War Room mm-hmm. in Shelbyville. They're uh, small time pastors all over this country, and they're not going along with this. They may not have the platform all the time uh, that you get when you climb the ranks of a denomination, but mm-hmm. uh, but but they're out there. And um, and then the Lord is going to use the weak things and the small things. I mean, look, I never thought I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. Yeah. I, I thought maybe it was game over for me as soon as I came <laughs> out of, you know, against the uh, Southeastern and what they were doing. 
but the Lord has his people, and we got to trust that he knows. He'll protect us. He'll He'll provide for us. He'll grow us through this. Mm-hmm. Even if we get canceled, I mean, hope Russell Fuller has been provided for. Yeah. Juan Riesco, my good friend, has been provided for. He was canceled, you know. Was he at Southwestern? So. Well, well, he wasn't in the SBC. He was, uh, he, the documentary Paint the Wall Black, he was, oh, uh, okay, right, right, you right. Know, he got canceled by the world. It was a harsher canceling right, right, than right, Russell right. Fuller got. I mean, they were trying to, you know, thousands of death threats to his family. And he's back at the same location selling food and Lord's protected and praise God. Oh, that's, yeah, somebody else told me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm I mean, of... the Lord protect. I'm just saying the Lord provides yeah. when you take those hard stands. And the, the fear is that, you know, you know, what's the worst they can do? What's yeah. the worst they can do? Kill you? I mean, whether you're in heaven, like, <laughs> yeah. So we just got to keep our eyes on God. Yeah. yeah. Fear those who are able to destroy. Fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Yeah. I mean, it's, Amen. I mean, what is Jesus? I mean, he's there. He tells them that. And we've seen this throughout history. You know, in different spouts and bouts and just not just in, you know, first century Palestine or wherever, Jerusalem, but here. I mean, even, you know, people used to burn Baptists at the stake because they weren't, you know, they're baptizing believers, you know, and Anabaptists and you know, everybody hated Anabaptists. And I mean, that's why they started Rhode Island, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. even before the, the war for independence and everything else. So um, at the Southern Baptist Convention and still being very much in the bubble. Right, uh, of of just seminary, and you know that to a degree. Like, oh, it's there, totally a bubble. There's a seminary yeah. bubble, like whatever seminary you're. I don't know if it's like it the same at New Orleans or especially like Gateway out in California, um, but here at Southern, Southeastern, Southwestern, right. the three big ones, uh, and Midwestern maybe I don't know. Anyway, I'm in Nashville, and I knew a number of people who were there. A couple local pastors here as well. Oh, hey, you know, meet up, have lunch. And I went to the Baptist 21 lunch. Now, I didn't know anything much about Baptist 21, but, you know, they have all the lunches at each of the conventions, and, you know, each day is different. They'll give you books and blah, blah, blah. And I've got a few books over here on my shelves. Nice. Um, and I don't know. I don't have any almost any desire to read anyone because they're just kind of like, I don't know what this is about. It's just kind of something <laughs> church about something. And it's like, this is a big topic. There was a panel, and this is before yeah. the presidential thing. I had never heard of Ed Litton, except for an article that we could talk about, maybe not, uh, that he'd written earlier in that year, early in 2021. He's on the panel. Moeller's on the panel. Danny Aiken's on the panel. Uh, Donna Gaines, Steve Gaines' wife, mm-hmm. and another guy. I don't know who it is. And the main guy, MCing, as it were, is Aiken's, one of Aiken's sons. I know he's got two or three sons. Um, and he asks point blank, his dad, who he's obviously known his whole life. And I'm sure they're great people, right? Like in one sense, we're talking about these are nice people, probably wonderful, love their family. Feed their provide, dog, yeah. Feed their dog, don't yeah. kick it, you know, that whole thing. But there's something going on, <laughs> you know, and not to sound like a conspiracy nut or whatever. But even there, he asks his dad, like you're Aiken, you know, Aiken Elder, and I'm the younger, and Dad, you know, tell me, you know, I've known you my whole life, but I feel like, you know, is there something you need to tell us? Are you sneaking in liberal theology? Did it? And he kind of asked it in a tongue-in-cheek way, but as if to quell everybody in the audience. Well, to make Dan, fun of anyone who would and, say. And or make fun of it, yeah. yeah like, and, it, and I get it, too, from a, you know, I'm a son. I still have my dad. I just saw them recently. They were out here for a road trip. I've got a son. He's five. Well, he just turned six. And so I understand the father relationship, you know, father-son relationship. Yeah. And it's like, is Danny Aiken a God-hating atheist? No. Is he a closet whatever? It doesn't seem like, but he's done so many things. And that's, I think, where a lot of kind of the middle of the road, I still kind of appreciate the Gospel Coalition, though I scratched my head and David Platt's sermon on that was a little weird. And I wish Matt Chandler didn't say that sort of thing. But I really, I'd rather not have Donald Trump as president. And I'd rather still have this. And uh, and there's a lot of just kind of mushy middle. They want to believe Aiken. Why can't we? Why can't, like, what is going on? I mean, again, you don't have to get into so many details, but yeah. what, like, what is happening and who is he particular, like, I guess, Aiken, um, what, who's he working for? I mean, <laughs> I guess for lack of a better word, you know, not like you necessarily know, yeah. but what's well, the end goal here to bring in critical theory, a Walter mm-hmm. Strickland, uh, you know, talking about these, 
very bizarre terms. We're not teaching about social justice. <laughs> or we're not teaching, we're just teaching about it. Yeah, right, right. That's the, always the defense. Yeah, it just caught me off guard like, wait, why are you even doing this? Why are you even talking? Because they like, know it's a problem. They know that there's exactly. people who have seen evidence. That's the problem. They have to overcome the evidence people have seen. And how and the, and the way that the politician works in the secular world is when they've been caught in a lie, they try to gaslight you. Mm -hmm. You know, I no, I didn't. I didn't lie. Or you're just misunderstanding. Or uh, they, they lies lead to more lies. And um, in the case of Southeastern, I mean, I, I'm a graduate from there. I've read, you know, a lot of the professors there and tried to figure out like what's going on. Uh, with the kingdom diversity and all that. And there's so many things. I mean, I could take up your time. I could spend an hour here talking about all the intricacies of this. But 30,000 foot view, we need to believe people's actions. Yeah. We just we can't just look at their words. And again, it comes back to the um, looking at superficial uh, qualities like someone's personality or, um, you know, like the, the allegiance to a guild and they're part of the same club I'm part of. Therefore, it's my responsibility to protect them because there's this hierarchy that we exist in uh, yeah. or some, some group, some fraternal organization. And the church is not a fraternal organization. Uh, it's, it's actually belongs to Christ. And if there's people in it, which they're, you know, newsflash, there are. In fact, we're told that... Uh, the, the devil plants tares among the wheat, yeah. and a tear looks like wheat. So if those kinds of people exist within the church, then it should come as no surprise that very smooth-talking, wine-and-dining type of people are going to uh, climb to the positions of power. And, uh, and very often, they can espouse ideas that are contrary to the gospel of Christ. Mm. And, you know, as far as Danny Aiken, so I'm not going to go into all the specifics, but look, look he's, I, I talk about this in my book, Christian and Social Justice, and I, I give you all the references. You don't have to, don't believe me. Don't believe me because I said it. That's one yeah. of the things I can't emphasize enough. It, I'm not the authority. Look, you know, check out what I'm saying. See if it's true. Mm. And, you know, he supports standpoint epistemology. He'll say he doesn't. Look at his words. Again, look at what he said on multiple occasions. And their and his actions. And look at his actions. Look at who he hires. Look at I mean, I've talked to him personally about some of this stuff. And it's you go around in circles and it's you never you know, they'll never admit that you understand what they said because but so you can't actually have a real conversation uh, mm -hmm. with with it's all political smoke and mirrors. But um, but look at, you know, look at Matt Mullins. Look at Walter Strickland. Look at what they've taught. Walter Strickland is very, very honest. He teaches liberation theology. He believes that uh, you know the law of God, the summation of the gospel, is loving the Lord with all your heart, loving your neighbor. That's the law. That's a category error, but it's one you'd expect from a liberation theologian. Um, he said things like, uh, to echo James Cone, that... Uh, the slaves had a, a true gospel or a full gospel, and the slave masters, they didn't. Huh. Based on what? The gospel yeah. is the work of Christ. Where you stand in a, in a hierarchy that once existed, uh, or, or the kinds of activism that you were involved with or not involved with, or the kinds of um, <clears throat> political positions you have, I mean, there may be a discipleship opportunity here. There may be an ethical issue here. But to say that you don't have the gospel simply because... I mean, does Abraham not have the gospel? Like, where, what gives you the right to just say that a group, because they're oppressed, has a truer gospel? Mm. There's, you're, you're mixing works with it somewhere. And that's what liberation theologians do. And that's what Walter Strickland has done many times. Uh, Matt Mullins, another professor at Southeastern. I mean, he's, he's the guy that said, you know, if you adopt a, a, a black kid or that you shouldn't adopt a black kid if you're white, Mm. Because, I mean, these are the kinds of things that are being said, very offensive things. It's ridiculous. Well, it, it is. Uh, it's, um, it, it's all motivated by critical race theory type thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and just recently, actually, I've covered this on the podcast. Someone had uh, taken pictures of some of his curriculum, a student, and put it out there and showed that, yeah, he's bringing critical race theory right into his class. Mm. I think it was a literature class at Southeastern. Um, and I could go on and on with the specifics of this, but th these are things that are publicly available. Go check out what Scott Crawford has said about this. Look at the montage that uh, was on his video about all, I mean, liberation theology, CRT, uh, some feminist stuff. I mean, it's all in there. Uh, I think there's been, I, I calculated it a few weeks ago. I think there's been now 
six different students. I'm just one of them who've mm. come out about Southeastern publicly wow. and shared concerns and tried to, to bring attention to it. And they, they felt like they never got anywhere going through official channels because you don't. Right. So you, you can believe them. You know, I mean, you could even do the social justice power play here. They're the victims, right? They're just students, <laughs> poor, lowly students. Right. You have That's to right. believe them. Yeah. Right. They're in the minority. They're in the minority. It's the, it's believe the people all with students. Be Hashtag. Me too. I, that's again. a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. But leave all <laughs> students. But that's so you have to find out what's the truth of the situation instead of just believing someone because they sound good when they say it. And you want to believe them. Right. And I want to believe them too. I don't want to think that our Southern Baptist know, seminaries are doing like... this. I want to believe that that's not happening. But, you know, what do you do when you're confronted with evidence that says the other otherwise? Wait, so, and it's hard. And that's a weird thing with. You know, again, I mentioned some friends because I do have some friends uh, who are very much kind of in the middle uh, on this subject. And it's like, but you wouldn't do this with your wife or with your son or with your parents. Like if your wife, you know, you come home from a, a trip, right? And she's in bed with another dude, you show up a day early and her words are going to mean very little, right? Very little, right? Because she's in bed with another dude. Right. Her actions are going to scream and her words are going to mean nothing. You're probably going to be filled with rage and leave. I think we all would. And then calm down. And then what in the world is happening? Right. Like actions, as the old phrase goes, speak louder than words. I mean, you can't yell at your wife. I love you. Or grab your children. And be like, You're so great. You know, and like that doesn't work. Right. You yeah. have to, you know, Hey, come here. Give me a hug, bud. Yeah. All right. How's your day? You know, and yeah. your, your actions match the words and they, and when they don't match, there's a discrepancy. And I think we're seeing that, you know, within the SBC, even the PCA, the Shelbyville uh, event yesterday, yeah. there was uh, I sat at a table. Most of the guys were, I think were PCA guys that I was talking to and they had back Baptist backgrounds as well. But they said the same thing and, you know, they were shaking their head with the Ligon Duncan sort of thing. And, no. you know, I don't I don't know too much about him. I know he used to be solid and he's kind of a Presbyterian uh, flavor. He wrote bowler. the forward of Woke Church. so Right. <laughs> exactly. You and you're like, <laughs> I, I get you're in the South. Obviously, you have a different like vantage point. But there's like, but where is that? And then there's this line of, yeah, but, right. Yeah, yeah but you need to, you can't just compromise on all these other issues and then say, well, but you still love Jesus and you're still such a good example. I mean, I know you, you were asked in the Q and a yesterday about book references and how much, you know, should you ref get, well, this guy's a little woke. Just be careful of that. Or chapter four is bad. Don't, don't read it. And you were kind of like, ah, I just, I'd rather not recommend something. I mean, I know you mentioned the <sighs> yeah. to BD book on church discipline. This isn't, I don't agree with everything or I recommended a, words from the fire from Moeller that he wrote on the 10 commandments he wrote it like 12 years ago. And in my video, I said, Hey, you should read these books this year. If you want to talk about the 10 commandments, you know, he wrote this a dozen years ago, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, he was different then. And there wasn't as many raging. Now he might've still thought the same things, but this book in and of itself about the 10 commandments sure, is really helpful. Sure. And so I think there is a level of balance, but it's hard when there's so many things firing off on all sorts of different areas. And yeah. You see on Twitter and you see this thing and there's this compromise and this head scratcher and you're like, what is going on? Let, let me say something, one more thing about Danny Aiken that might help a little bit with people in the middle. Uh, again, it's, I'm not saying not to focus on motive at all, but that shouldn't be the primary thing. Yeah. We need to look at what they're saying. What, where is this leading people? Uh, does it contradict the Bible? And so much of that gets put into the back burner. But I, th I think it might be helpful for me to talk about motive for a moment. There's a book that Danny Aiken contributed to, and I can't remember the name of it, from, kind of before the woke stuff really got moving, on racism, the Bible and racism. And there, in the chapter that Danny Aiken wrote, he talks about growing up, I think he, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Georgia, uh, that he grew up in Georgia. And uh, you know, during a time, I guess at the beginning of his life, segregation, you know, uh, was just kind of fading out. Mm -hmm. And so um, <clears throat> he rem has memories about, you know, when things were segregated more. And there's, you sense if you read this, that there's a bit of a guilty conscience over this whole thing. That, that, huh. You know, that really shouldn't have been there. Yeah, That wasn't right. And he tells a story about his mother picking up a student and driving the student uh, home from school who was, who was black. And... 
uh, someone had asked, I, I guess he said someone had given his mom a hard time. Why would you take that student home from school? And the mother says, well, he needed a ride. Yeah. Right. And so this is the basis, though. Danny Aiken, as far as I, I remember from this book, he uses that to justify the Kingdom Diversity Program at Southeastern. He says, and that's why we have, you know, Kingdom yeah. Diversity at Southeastern. Now, think about that for a moment. What was the basis for his mother picking up a student and, and perhaps going against some social, uh, you know, uh, uh, assumptions that were in that area of Georgia where Danny Aiken was? Uh, it was the, the basis for it was he had a need. He needed a ride. Yeah. She wasn't looking at him as a black person, a white person. And he, she just, he, yeah. he's a man, being he's a young, boy that needs a ride. Whatever, yeah. What does Kingdom Diversity do? It yeah. doesn't look at people based on they need, an, an, you know, they need to come and they have a financial need or it's looking for, sp I've seen the applications. I've seen the questions they ask. Mm -hmm. It's looking for activists and it's looking for activists who are minorities Wow. It's it's the it's the exact thing Danny Aiken says that he's against judging people based on their skin color. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and there, you know, there's not a person I've never I don't know anyone. I don't know if I've ever even met anyone that uh, and I'm sure they exist that wants to go back to a segregated society. Um, there's you know, th this is a, a boogeyman that comes up. I think the left uses to try to pigeonhole conservatives as if they support this or they want to bring us. But no, I don't know anyone who does. But there is, I think, in the minds of some people who grew up at that time, a, a bit of a guilt, a bit of a, yeah, a wanting to, and it's too late for them, right? That, yeah. that ended a long time ago. And there's a wanting to, I, I wish I could have been part of the civil rights move, movement. Well, they're claiming they're the modern civil rights movement and I can join in with them. Mm. But what he's ended up doing is he's created a whole thing at Southeastern that literally looks at you according to where you stand, your, your race and then will accrue benefits to you, uh, a scholarship, because of your race yeah. and whether or not you're going to be an activist and support their um, diversity uh, agenda. And, and that's what the Kingdom of Diversity, that's a yeah, well, Kingdom program. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you okay. apply for a grant. You that. apply okay. for a grant at Southeastern. That's actually the thing that w it really started going that woke direction once the Kingdom Diversity Initiative got going in, mm. I think it was 2016 or something. And... Um, and it's so opposite what he talks about with his mom. His mom was looking at someone and looking past any skin color, anything. They need a ride. I'm going to yeah. help. And Love of Christ. Cool. I've got a car. He doesn't. Right. Great. And he's not doing that. He says that that's why they're doing the, you know, but that's not, they're doing actually what it's, it's more similar to what the segregationists might've done in a way. Cause he's, he's looking at people first through the kingdom diversity program as they're a black person yeah. or they're an Asian person or whatever. And they, uh, they, they should have some benefits that we're not going to give to other people who are of, sorry, you're creating discrimination at this point based on that mm -hmm. quality. So I, I just, I, I find it interesting, but I, I wanted to bring it up because I think it explains perhaps that that's the hook that I think some people hear and they think, well, there's a good motivation here. You know, you, he wants to, he doesn't like the segregation that he remembers and he was trying to overcome it and look at his good heart and look at yeah. uh, what, what his intentions are so good. And, and what I'm saying is that could all be true. Yeah. It could be true. Maybe he's not, you know, this secret atheist Marxist guy trying to subvert this. He doesn't have to be, mm -hmm. but uh, the devil loves to use people. He loves to use good intentions to forward evil things. And yeah. That's what we have going on in mass right now. Uh, and, and the motivations need to, we need to stop judging things based on personality, motivation. Uh, you can acknowledge it, but then primary, I mean, we just talked about it this morning from Romans 16, teaching contrary to the doctrine that we have been given. Mm -hmm. What's the doctrine that we have been given? Uh, it, the doctrine we've been given is not subject to your social location. It's not, there's no barrier that you have in understanding true justice if you're white. There's no, um, it's not attached to the gospel to forward some egalitarian, you know, social crusade. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, we don't look at people and reduce them down to some power relationship and make that the fundamental thing. That's not biblical, Right. Uh, so, you know, ethics is Christian ethics uh, is not redistributive. So these yeah. are these are just fundamental things that a lot of these guys in the SBC uh, that might have good intentions are forwarding that are they're against the doctrine we've been taught. Yeah. And, and that's got to be the issue. Um, I think David Wells does this well in No Place for Truth. He traces now he only traces up to 1994 
but there's been a trajectory over the past century to get away from objective truth uh, to to there's a downplaying of theology. There's those things don't really matter, and it and what you what are you left with after that? It's superficial stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's yeah the fact that people focus on personality so often or well he said he's not a marxist he said he's not doing critical race theory he said he's not teaching i mean i've seen with uh james Lindsay, who's an atheist which is so funny uh, in some respects but he he brings it up that it's praxis they're practicing these things especially in elementary schools of course they're not teaching some legal theory from you know decades ago about whatever to second graders they're not teaching like this crazy complicated thing they're teaching the idea of the boots on the ground marching this is what you're going to do this is the praxis of it um but the same logic like you're you're saying then the elites in big eva as it were and and other places but especially big eva should use that same argument or use their discretion against muslims and say well muslims are really nice people they're really family friendly or muslims well muslims I met Mormons, but Muslims too, but especially Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, all these people are very nice. They're they're big on the marriage, and you know, I mean, they say they love God. What's the big deal? That's how they gain converts. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and that and that's just this whole conglomeration of. I mean, Joel Osteen, right? Yeah. Such a nice guy. God is clearly blessing him. I mean, that's Pharisaical logic, right? Like, well, he has a bunch of stuff, so God must love him. And you got hurt and or your legs are not working since birth. Therefore, God cursed you. Right. And it's like, right. we don't do this with those guys. We can see their false doctrine. But somehow, when we're standing on this side of the line, we're like, yeah, oh, he's good. He said he's good. He said he's not a cultural Marxist. So he said he's not teaching critical race theory in his classroom. And it's like, but he is, though. And it's like, well, but he said he's not. It's like, are you an idiot? Like, what is wrong with you? Why are you not? Why do you not see these things? So... I don't know. It's, well, I mean, Dan, Danny Aiken said once, I don't know how we got on Danny Aiken for this <laughs> That's the example here, but he said once that, uh, you know, critical race theory, it, it, it was a, it was a podcast on Baptist 21 actually mm-hmm. with his son was hosting. And then he was with a, another one of the professors that pushes CRT at Southeastern, uh, Deuce, uh, Williams branch, mm-hmm. Williams, oh. William branch, but they call him Deuce. Uh, so he, he had this whole thing where he, it was just, I mean, you go listen to this podcast. It's like, trying to nail jello to a wall Mm. we're against critical race theory but hey guess what critical race theory has some great insights on where to find oppression and in the places where it agrees with christianity we can say yes and places it doesn't we can say no but we're not teaching it we're just using some of the tools from it and so this like and you're at the end you're like well what you what are you because you can't have both it's impossible it's it's totally impossible if you use the tools you're using it the tools carry the assumptions. You know, the assumptions of critical race theory run right into the tools. You wouldn't have the tools without them. They're, they rest upon the assumptions that uh, uh, I mean, I'll go through all of them. But you know that whiteness is uh, favoring some people and not others in our society, and that we need to listen to the voices of color to figure out how to alleviate oppression, mm. and uh, that uh, just because you know there's we've ended segregation of those kinds of things doesn't mean that any progress has really been made. And I mean, there's all these assumptions and you'll hear some of these professors start spouting these very assumptions, but then they'll say, I'm not, I'm not teaching CRT. It's like, well, then what is CRT? <laughs> yeah. You know, which is one of the questions I like I, people should ask that. I think more It's like, Hey, what is CRT? What do you think it is? Yeah. You know, it's this phantom idea that nobody, it, actually that no one, no one believes. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's uh, like, what is it? Trans fat. Like remember trans fat, like had to be put on the labels and you check every label and trans fat's not on anything. You're like, why are we even dealing with trans fat? Like it's not in anything, including donuts. Like, where is it? Like it's, that just popped in my head, but I mean, it's a good analogy. It's, yeah. it's funny. Cause th- that's really what's happening. Well, they never define it. They exactly. never define it. It's just, you're hateful if you even suggest they're teaching it, but they can't define it. Yeah. So um, you, you, that's political doublespeak. That's all that is. And you, you have to be a little shrewder. Uh, you ha- and, and it's hard for us. We, we're getting into a mode now, I think, where every institution has failed us. Mm. A lot of uh, conservatives, especially political conservatives, are coming to this conclusion, and Christians, that, okay, I can't trust the media, right? I can't trust my government. I can't even trust my elections now. I can't trust mm-hmm. the, like, the, the ministries that I used to trust. I can't. There's a crisis of 
uh, leadership and faith. And we, we don't have, um, it, it, we're very unstable at this point. And so I think there's an incentive to want to trust. I can't, please, I, I can't, I can't handle another one, guys. Right. I want to be able to trust that the church I go to and the seminary we support are solid. And, and I don't want to even go there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I get that. I understand that. But we do have a responsibility if we're funding this, if the Lord's money is going to this, uh, there's got to be some accountability somewhere along the line. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so my encouragement for people is just like, look, the motive here should not ever be we want to beat up on anyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to love them. We want to love Danny Aiken. We want to love Southern Baptists. We want to love Christians. We want to love people that ever, everyone, but we want to love people enough to protect them from false ideas that will hurt them. And that's yeah. what ultimately happens. Every time social justice is tried, it leads to, uh, it, it, it's never a solution. It always leads to grief, to hurt, to pain, 20th century to death. Yeah. So millions of deaths. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, and it's, and that's the funny thing. It's, it's all over the scripture. <clears throat> I mean, you preach from Romans 16. I read from Jude uh, 1, right? The first few verses, you know, and multiple other places. I mean, Paul calling out Demas and Hymenaeus and Alexander and, mm-hmm. and either particular people by name or just saying, be careful, watch out, take guard, this and this. I mean, and we can, and everybody we've mentioned and many more who really, I believe, love Jesus. They're, they're, I don't, they seem to, you know, be a professing Christian who's faithful and, and but they've gotten, either they are a wolf or they've just gotten on this wrong track and they would say, yeah, amen, amen, amen to all those Bible verses. And you're like, but you're not doing that or you're only doing it halfway. And that's, I think, what's so disturbing. I mean, even the, I've heard it more than once lately with, and it's a tribute to Spurgeon, but, you know, it's not between the difference between right and wrong, but right and almost right. Yes. In the sense that it's like, oh, like, oh, it's so close. Not like Mormonism, you know, way, way, way off. Like they're not even close, but they try to appear to be close. And the, you know, gullible Christians who don't know their Bibles might be sucked into that and think, oh yeah, it's just another denomination and they're so friendly and, you know, they got some special underwear and some weird other things, but okay. You know, but that's because you have low discretion. People who are running our seminaries, our institutions, our publishing houses, um, are appearing on CNN and, and whatever, Come on, you got to have a little bit more Bible discernment here and stop, you know, kowtowing or soft pedaling to the world. Yeah, well, CNN and MSNBC and the New York Times and the Washington Post aren't inviting people to write and do interviews because they're so interested in Christianity. Right. Right. So an Ed Stetzer or Russell Moore Seriously. or anyone from you know the evangelical guild goes on as the spokesperson for evangelicalism on CNN, <laughs> they're using you. Yeah, that's yeah. what they and you watch it every single time. They use people that are in our camp to condemn the others to signal to them what they're doing wrong. Mm-hmm. And then they call that speaking prophetically, which is not speaking prophetically, but they don't share the gospel. They'll, they they bring them on to say, well, hey, why are evangelical Christians not getting vaccinated at the rate they should be? Yeah. And then they have the preacher chide evangelicals that they ought to be getting vaccinated. And, you know, that's why they do it. It's You have to be a little smarter and a little more shrewd. And so one of the things pastors can do, and you, so you're an example of someone who does this, but... Uh, don't have your, we need to study the Bible. We need to know the Bible, but we need to also be able to apply it. So we have to get outside the bubble. As Mm -hmm. you said, you know, we have to get outside of that to see what's going on in the world. What are people thinking? Get on the streets, evangelize, you know, look at the new, live in the world. Don't be of it, but live in it. And once you understand what's going on and you can actually apply the scripture to the situation. So a lot of pastors, I think, uh, they they don't they struggle with this or they don't realize that they have this inadequacy where their whole life is uh, kind of on exegeting the text and whatever you know evangelical books are coming out and conferences and there's there's a whole bubble you can sort of be part of and never really you're just repeating what you're hearing you're mm-hmm. you're getting whatever the new cool shiny object is but you're not aware of what's happening outside of that yeah. And so we need to be aware of what's happening outside of that so we can apply it correctly. Uh, so that's one of the things I think um, that that I've been trying to do as I travel around is, all right, let's, you, you notice how I start like my presentations. I don't start with, thus saith the Lord. I start with, 
what is social justice? Yeah. Let's understand what the thing is we're dealing with first. Now I go into the, thus saith the Lord, let's apply what the Bible says to this. Yeah. And that's so vital. If you miss that first step, then you're, you, you have, you're just, you know, planking around and just making all kinds of opinions, but you don't actually know what you're talking about. Uh, so we need to understand what critical race theory is first. Then you can make an assessment about whether Danny Aiken's pushing it or not. Right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't take long. Just spend an afternoon on the internet. Yeah. Right? It's, it's not even that complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's amazing. And that's a funny thing. That sometimes you'll get, you'll get the world that's so much more honest about whatever it is. You know, right now, obviously, it's the Black Lives Matter stuff and just critical race theory in general, but even just the LGBT stuff. And it's like, they're very honest. No, this is wrong. No, I'm not a Christian because of blah, blah, blah. This is what I believe. This is what I'm teaching. Right. And yet you have Christians who I guess want to, you know, we want to be politicians or, or some of us do and kind of appeal to over here and like, well, I can't upset my mom. I can't, you know, if I say this in my church, but I'm going to wink and nod over here at the CNN or, you know, the, the lower level media outlets. And it's like, uh, you're not the same person. You're clearly riding the fence and trying to, and you just can't ride the fence. Well, I mean, you, especially in vital things. Like we're not talking about the papacy, right? Like 500 years ago, we could say the Pope come in. Hey, you're not, you're not head of the church. Jesus is. I'd get burnt at the stake. We probably all would, right? Yeah. Francis could come to my church now for whatever reason. Sit there. I would say that to his face. He'd probably say something under his breath and leave. Nothing would happen to me because that's now not the fight. Now the fight is the things we've been talking about and many more. The fight isn't about Protestantism and the papacy and how the infallibility of the Pope. Most Roman Catholics don't even believe that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. so we're, we're arguing you know, about slavery. Oh, slavery is bad. And it's like, yeah, we know. You had the thing like 20 years ago, 25 years ago. You condemned it already, like multiple times. Moving on. Like, it's bad. It was bad. Okay, great. Now what are we fighting now? Everybody knows it's bad. Right. Chattel slavery is bad. Antebellum, high, well, terrible, blah, 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 man stealing. They, they, okay. They always want to condemn the things that don't cost them. Exactly. That's and right. then the things that will cost them, they don't want to condemn. So it's a basic uh, problem of pleasing man and not pleasing God. That's really what it all comes down to. Yeah. So an orientation and a motivation towards what man thinks and how to gain his, uh, be in his good graces. And you know, if we can just, we can game this. It's actually, so for all the Calvinists to get involved with this is really weird to me because <laughs> they're like, only God can change the human heart. It's got to be a work of God. But then on the other hand, it's like, we can game the system, guys. Yeah. Like there's this really cool strategy we have for, if you know, bending on this, this, and this, and uh, really getting into the good graces of people on the political left or something. And then they'll hear the gospel. Yeah. It's like, why are you even, why are you even thinking that way? Yeah. They're, they hate the gospel. Not, I'm not saying the left, but unconverted man hates the gospel. Yeah. Like you're not going to game the system. There's no political strategy to figure out a way in which you can uh, subversively uh, you know, get people to be Christians. Um, no, it's, it's got to be a work of, of God and the Holy Spirit. And you just got to trust him. And yeah. if you're called names, if you're called a hater, okay, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's... It, whatever. The apostles like were called Persecution's stuff. not new, y'all. Like, you know, or even just name calling. Like, <laughs> Yeah, Jesus was called names. Yeah. You know, today, or this is an interesting thing. I mean, I've been thinking about it. What would Jesus be called? Today? Like, what do you think Je names Jesus would be called today? Like, if he was around... White nationalists. Yeah, they probably call yeah. things like he would be called a racist. He loves Israel Christ too much. Christian nationalist, you know, uh, a Nazi. I mean, they they would saying that he was a friend with Gentiles and tax gatherers. That was the same kind of thing. It was that mm. strong of a condemnation, and the way Jesus handled it, obviously, was he handed it right back to him and yeah. pointed out their hypocrisy. Uh, and so that's that's how he engaged culture. If you want to think about engaging culture the way Jesus did, mm. it's you're going to you know call me those names. I'm going to point out your sin. I mean, this is what you're in trouble with before a holy God. You know, that's you're, so so that's, that's how to engage culture, not to try to like, man, I sure hope they don't call me a name. Maybe if I say this, they'll think I'm cool. Or, yeah. If I'm on. cool, then they'll think I'm cool and I'm just like them. But somehow I have this Jesus and therefore they'll repent and believe the gospel. Right, right. Like, right. I don't know what sort of evangelism that is, but it's it's not in the Bible. <laughs> well, you got anything else you want to add? I'll, I'll, I'll uh, end with this. I actually, so um, 
thinking about like white nationalists, people like that. There's I, I like met two in my life probably. Yeah. Um, one was in Michigan. It was weird. The, the other one though, and it's, I don't know, this guy was kind of on the fringe, kind of an alt right, but like open to that. Um, anyway, cool story because I want to end on an up note here. Uh, you know, this guy came to the college career group I was leading years ago, uh, right before I think the 2016 election and kind of you know, figured out it, there was a lot of issues with yeah. this guy as far as identity issues and stuff. And so, so that attracted him to this crowd that, that believed in this alt right stuff. Um, and, uh, and it's so like Richard Spencer, that's what I'm talking about. I know alt right gets thrown out there a lot. So it's like that kind of stuff. And the more he came, he, he became a Christian, you mm-hmm. know, helped lead him to the Lord, uh, he, it was a beautiful thing and he rejected all that stuff when he became a Christian and it, it broke my heart, um, a bit when I went to seminary and I saw the way they were trying to engage this whole issue. And it was in a way they, my friend who is now, he's my brother in Christ. He, you know, he, he is friends with the black people. I would go to one of the most diverse churches you'll ever see. I mean, it's in a diverse community, but he, he loves those people, right? Mm-hmm. There's no hatred at all. Yeah, he he's in Christ with them. Um, he would submit to their authority if they, you know, were um, in charge of something, gladly. Uh, and it's just such a tragedy the way that the Southern Baptists, on the highest levels, have chosen to deal with the issues confronting us now is to just demonize those people mm. to just how, because they always say, well, how are we going to reach the world? No, they're not talking about the world. They're talking about the media. Mm. They're talking about media elites. They're doing the partiality James warned us about. They favor the rich man when he walks in and they say, here's the chief seat for you. Yeah. Hey, poor man. Hey, white nationalist, right? You go out. How are you going to reach those people? How are you going to reach the white nationalists? Right. Mm. If, I mean, I'm not saying there's a lot of them, but that's the myth that we're told is that's everywhere. Oh, everybody's everyone's saying, right. Everybody's far right. Yeah. Far, how are you going to reach them? How? Yeah. And and they are reachable. They're the, the grace of God can touch them. They are people. Yeah. Just like anyone else. And so I'm not defending white nationalism like that at all. It's in fact I've seen uh, I was instrumental in helping a guy walk out of this. But um, but that's I think we're off target. We're off. We're losing our mission to reach people with the gospel when we start just taking a group and dehumanizing them and mm-hmm. using them as just the ones we beat up on all the time uh, and uh, to get into the good graces of the rich man, of those with the authority in every arena in our yeah. culture. So um, that's an encouraging thing, I think, for everyone is that, look, people get saved. And sometimes it's the it's the Nazis can come to the Lord, Amen. I mean, yeah. right? Uh, just like communists, and, can, and communists, communists can come to the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> it happens, yeah. Right? So, yeah, it, it's definitely yeah. There's definitely a massive partiality going on, and either uh, you're you're you know a deplorable <laughs> hash hash up old term, but or irredeemable, and or and this is what I saw, especially in conversations with my fellow coworker, former coworker, where there's this like. You don't need the gospel. And I've got a, I've got a good friend. He's down in Atlanta, more melanated, he says. I uh, black guy. And he's actually he's been uh, doing some good work on uh, YouTube and other stuff, Spotify, and called Dear Woke Christian. It's actually. Oh, good. yeah. I don't know who you're talking about. Jason, yeah, 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 yeah. And he, you know, he's like, Jesus is better. The Bible is better. He's like, I, I have sin. You have sin. Don't tell me that I don't, I can't, I don't need to be redeemed. And that's what a lot of it boils down to is like, well, you're, you know, you got more melanin, you're from this culture, you're just, you're, you're okay the way you are. And really what they're doing, the people who are anti-racist are the actual racist. They're pet, they're, you know, oh, it's okay, poor black guy. Let's use the you're, biblical you're, term. You're, you're smart. The sin of partiality. Partiality, exactly. Yeah. They're that's the partial. biblical sin. Yeah. It's not, racism is, there's like 30,000 versions of it now and yeah. who knows what it means. That's true. Sin of partiality at this point, that's what they're guilty of. Yeah. That's what they're, yeah, they're making they're making lowering him and his group and then castigating this group over here because they're the bad ones and this and this, but we love you. And it's like you're the gospel is there and you're not preaching it to either group. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. No, it is. Partiality though, that's a better term, yeah, for sure. Well, race, I'm not correcting you. I'm just saying. Well, no, no, that's, no, no. I mean it's that's all right. Um, but no, it is it's more accurate because it is not only scripture, just like being nice. That's not in the Bible. Being kind, being kind, being gentle, loving, that's in the Bible. But the 11th commandment is not in there. 
It's just not. So right, right. That shall be nice. Right. Well, you're going to get canceled now. So. Oh, yeah. I hope to. Actually, I'm, I try and preach and do as much as I can to get canceled as fast as possible. It hasn't worked yet, so... We'll see. We'll see. But uh, this has been a pleasure. I appreciate it. Yeah. Time. Well, thank you, Richard. Yeah, brother. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right. Well, everybody, see you later. Hope you enjoyed this conversation and uh, drop a comment. Let me know if you did or if you hate John or me or both of us. I'm just kidding. All my audience loves us. So. <laughs> anyway, we'll see you later.